Un Academy. Let's crack it. Good evening to all of you. So here I am to discuss the UPSC mains paper three, basically economic questions, which were asked in the UPSC mains 2023 exam. So just me, let me just uh, tell you about the overall level of questions. If anyone has read economy, then they will be able to handle most of the questions. Quite, uh, I would say that quite doable questions and mostly on the same topics so I think you can answer these questions in a much easier way but uh, how to present these questions again you, re you require articulation and uh, skill level to present the answers in a better way the question may seem easier and you may think that you have done well in the exam but what exactly to write and what exactly the question is demanding from you, that you need to understand. So, we start with the first question. A very good question and this question, in the last 10 years, this question has been asked 3-4 times just by changing the language. So, again also we have seen this kind of question, similar question, this time just the language has changed. So, the question is, faster economic growth requires increased share of the manufacturing sector in GDP, especially particularly MSMEs. We will handle that particularly MSMEs, but the main question is faster economic growth requires higher share of manufacturing in GDP. Now, the same question or similar question which has been asked earlier that why your manufacturing share didn't increase, can India become a developed nation? without uh, manufacturing. This is the almost same question. Now, I would tell you that what to write, but let me first clarify that what this question is exactly demanding. This question is saying two things, faster economic growth. So, he's talking about the economic growth, which is generally our 6%, 7% growth, economic growth. And then he's talking about the share. So, if we talk about uh, Economic, economic growth. Now you know that our economic growth is 6 to 7 percent on an average. Uh, in, during COVID, we went into recession. After that, our growth was more than 9 percent. But generally, you will see that we see a growth of 6 to 7 percent on an average. This is real. Now, this 6 to 7 percent growth has come from three sectors agriculture. Industry. Industry majority is manufacturing. Majority is manufacturing and services. Industry includes manufacturing, then construction, electricity, water, and things. But majority is manufacturing. Now, all economic growth is 600 percent. This growth is the weighted average of these three sectors. So, our agricultural growth generally on average around 3.3%. Industry growth around 5 to 6%. Services growth 8 So, the weighted, again, let me clarify you, weighted average of these is this. The weighted average of the growth of these sectors, agriculture, industry, and services, basically. Comes six to seven. Now the question is that faster economic growth. If we want to increase this higher growth, faster growth, it requires increased share of manufacturing sector in GDP. So we require this. I, I have written this. This is the growth. This, this is growth. If we talk about share, share in GDP. So share in GDP is. Agriculture around 16%, manufacturing around 17%, industry around 30%. Out of 30% uh, out of 30 industry, manufacturing is 75 and services 54%. So 54%, 30%, 60%. Manufacturing we use interchangeably with the uh, industry because majority is now question is saying that if we want higher of this, if you want this to be more, 
the share of manufacturing solution. The question is not saying that if we want higher growth, manufacturing should grow. This is not the question. The question is that if we want higher growth, this share should be larger. If the share should be larger, if the cell will be larger, automatically this will be. So let us discuss this. So you try to understand. I that is going just by 3.5%. If this will be more, our growth will come. If the share of agriculture will increase and agriculture is growing just by 3.5%, so our growth will not increase. So agriculture in any way, no point of discussing agriculture because growth rate is less. If this share will increase, the rate of increase will come down. Now coming to industry and service. Industry manufacturing service. Question could also have been that faster economic growth requires larger share of services in the future. If you see here, if this base is larger and it is going at 8-9 percent, our growth would have been much more. So why this was not the question? If this base, this is a weighted average, if this base would have been larger. Our growth, this growth, could have been more. But question is not that we, if uh, higher level, higher services growth will break down, will this will be possible through higher share of uh, services. This is not the question. Question is saying manufacturing because we cannot increase our growth through services because this is at such a scale. Our services doesn't have the scope of further increase. This has reached maximum approx. Since last 10 to 15 years, this is concentrated. Further improvement here is, I am talking about the share is difficult. Why it is difficult? Because it is absorbing very less people, mostly skilled, and most of the people are unemployed, the demand in the economy is not increasing, so services will not be supplied. Second, services, whatever we are producing, most of the services are not created and consumed domestically. But if we increase this share, we can export our products all the world. So that's the reason that this question says that faster growth requires increased share of manufacturing. If we increase this share, and this share can again be increased only by faster growth in manufacturing. So your, this growth, why we have not been able to grow consistently at 8-9% because of lack of demand. Why there is a lack of demand? Because our manufacturing base is not large. Manufacturing share in GDP is not large. If our manufacturing share in GDP would have been large, it would have absorbed a lot of unskilled population. There would have been demand in the economy, they would have got input, it would have created demand in the economy, and it would have grown consistently at certain levels. Our growth is mostly service driven, which has employed few people. Few people are getting good income, so it is not leading to sustainable. So if this is larger, it requires increased share of manufacturing. So if our manufacturing increases, this base will increase, then only our growth can be sustainable and larger. So in this question, you will have to focus on few points. First thing is that you must mention this data. Because faster economic growth, you have to write this data also. This growth has been derived from three figures, this one, this one, and this one. So you should also mention this. Plus, it is talking about the share in manufacturing. So this you need to mention. So this data must come in the uh, answer. Now, on what points you should focus? So the question talks about faster growth. Can we we can get faster growth by manufacturing? So you should focus that. You should you have to mention that uh, since agriculture growth is less, and the share of agriculture cannot increase because its growth is less. Services, the market is limited, most of the services are not exported and our services have reached peak. So the only expansion is possible in manufacturing and our manufacturing has not expanded that way. If our manufacturing absorbs the surplus labor from agriculture, then our manufacturing growth will increase. Plus, the demand which is lacking in India, which is not which doesn't allow us for consistently at a higher growth rate. If we absorb its surplus labor, 
they will get consistent income and then they want to distribute and that manufacturing will increase and when manufacturing will increase then the economic growth will also increase. So you have to write all these points. Now coming to particularly MSPs. So when this question says that larger share of manufacturing. So larger share of manufacturing and then it says particularly of MSPs. So how do you justify this? So the justification is or manufacturing contributes manufacturing share in GDP is 17 percent manufacturing share in GDP is 17 percent but MSME's contribution in manufacturing is more than 40 percent MSME's share in manufacturing is more than 40 percent this tells about the importance of MSMEs in manufacturing. This thing you need to write, and then you should also write that MSMEs are more labor intensive. They will employ more labor, and more labor will get income, and it will create a sustainable demand, which will lead to higher and faster. So MSME will need to tell this thing. Plus, you can tell about the number of MSMEs and more than 6 crores and it is going around 12 crores. So MSME, this, this figure must come, this is the share of MSME, uh, share of MSMEs in manufacturing. So MSME, and then you just write one or two points that MSMEs are labor intensive, MSMEs provide the ancillary support to the bigger industries, it acts as a complementary mix rather than conflict with the big companies, all these points you can write. So it's just a 10 marker question, so this will be sufficient. Now, comment on the present policies of the government in this case. Now, we see that present, uh, comment on the present policy of the government in this regard. So, you have to comment on the policies related to which are talking about the increase of share of manufacturing and one or two policies regarding MSMEs also. Because comment on the present policy in this regard. That means on this statement. So this is about general manufacturing and particularly about MSME. So you have to focus on manufacturing policies plus MSME. So you can focus on the policies. The first thing you should focus on maybe. Now question says comment on the present policy. So you have to comment. Comment karna that means you need to tell in one line, in two, two lines basically. What actually this policy has done, or maybe if the challenges are very restrict. Make in India, PLI, then you write your policy related to MSME, Udyo Aadhar number, Udyo Aadhar number, then other schemes related to MSME, Champions scheme. There are various schemes, you just need to write. Champions scheme as Paris scheme. And then you just move to like full IC, you just tell about Make in India, you just need to tell that Make in India one or two successful examples. For example, factories in Kapurthala and Tamil Nadu Hill factory, then Nokia factory, Samsung factory in Noida, Electro Foods, PLI scheme, you may also write. So one or two lines regarding all these things and how it is leading to increase in share of manufacturing. So Make in India, you may provide the data. When we launched Make in India, it, the share of manufacturing was around 15 percent. Now it is 17, 15 percent, 17, 17.5 percent, 17 percent. Right? Actually, it is 17.3 percent. Don't say that we have just increased by 2.3 percent. It will be percentage. It will come much higher. So, this is the share which has increased. So, 15% to 17.3%. PLI schemes, you may say that it has a very increase of exports of manufactured goods. Udyo Ara number, it is formalizing MSMEs and leading to MSMEs becoming more formal and they are able to achieve economies of the scale of infrastructure. Champion scheme is for hand holding MSMEs. Government is, this is an ICT based platform which is helping MSMEs. Government uses the grievances and resolves them to expand their business, to expand their size of the company. So, you just need to write 
then how will you conclude it? So you may conclude it is that uh, if for a country for a, such a large country like India where we have used surplus labor, the only way to increase growth is manufacturing, which government is trying for the last so many years with suitable policies and it will definitely help in increasing its target of 25% in GDP. In this you can also add infrastructure related policies, but no need to go too much into the field. Just focus on manufacturing activities. Fine. So, facts must come in that place. Fine. Now, let me move on to the second question. So the next question is, how does e-technology help farmers in production and marketing of agricultural produce? How does e-technology help farmers in production and marketing of agricultural produce? So in your syllabus there is a topic called uh, e-technology in the aid of farmers. Since the last so many years, governments, there is an ex uh, excessive push of government towards using e-technology. E-technology means electronic technology. In this question, you cannot uh, in general use mechanized equipments. You have to focus on e technology. So, how does e technology help farmers in production and uh, marketing? In production and marketing of agricultural products. So, first, to start with, you need to write about the various technologies that government is, uh, that we are using, right? And then you have to tell that how those technologies are helping in increasing production. So, first we need to write intro. In that intro, you will write that since last so many years ago, we have Indian farmers have started using more technology, more e-technology platforms or more e-technology. For example, you will write artificial intelligence, drones, satellites, and uh, sensors. This technology you write in the introduction. Then you write that uh, it is helping in the production in the following ways. So you ha you have to mention those technologies and you have to relate that how exactly it is helping in production. So you write that uh, through sensors we have been able to know the exact level of uh, water level or exact requirement of water in the soil and we are displaying water only in that precise area. So it has helped in improving resource use efficiency, which has helped in increasing better production because once you do flood system, flood uh, irrigation, then certain fields are flooded with water or certain fields there, uh, there is a lack of water. So through uh, this census, we have been able to precisely apply the water wherever it is required. Then you will be, you can say, Drones fitted with cameras, drones fitted with cameras precisely pinpoint that where is the pest attack and fertilizer is spread only there. Then you have robots, robots, artificial intelligence, drones, sensors, all this connected over internet, internet of things. Now internet of things, how it is healthy in production? Robots, sensors, drones, all this are connected over internet of things. If there is a pest attack, the drone with cameras, they will tell and the robot will 
spray fertilizers only in that course. So it is helping in improving resource use efficiency because it is helping in increasing the production. Of course, if we can handle the pressure attack on time because manually you cannot predict the entire farm on a daily basis and know where exactly the pressure attack can start with. So if you can know it timely, you can prevent that pressure attack. And excessive fertilizers or pesticides also hamper the aid and products. Now, if you know exactly that which area has pest attack or where is the problem or where is the dead soil, then as per the coordinates which will be provided, robots will specifically spray fertilizers or pesticides in that area, leading to increased production. So, all these technologies you need to mention. Now, marketing. So, how key technology is helping the marketing of agricultural products? You, you need to name certain things. For example, ENAM is the best. Now, ENAM will have to tell that how it is exactly helping in marketing. So, you just need to tell that ENAM has increased the options for sale for the Indian farmers. Earlier, Indian farmers were selling only the KMC only. Now, through ENAM, they can sell to the entire country. Then, FCI has started procurement. FCI has made all this procurement online. Earlier, farmers used to go and wait for a long time in the queue. Now, all these things. Procurement and payment is being done through online. Online is in the Monday, of course, the farmers will have to bring this on Monday, but all this process has been automated through information and communication technology. Then, Isrul Bhuvan app is there. Bhuvan app is there, which is helping farmers to directly connect with the markets, and farmers can be directly connected and they can sell their goods. Then, and it's also providing the various data, JS level data, which is helping farmers in including marketing their products. Then ITC is the key. ITC is each of all is there. So all these things are helping in the marketing of products. Plus, various e-commerce startups have launched e-commerce portals. Startups have launched e-commerce portal where farmers can directly sell their produce. If whichever have, whichever states have allowed, certain states have allowed, for example, Uttarakhand, UP, Telangana, they have allowed direct sale by the farmers. So farmers are using these e-commerce platforms to directly sell their produce to the retail chains. So all these things are helping. Uh, in the marketing of agricultural produce. Plus one more thing, warehouse receipts. A farmer can keep their uh, produce in the warehouse and they get e-warehouse receipts. E and W. Negotiable warehouse receipt. A farmer don't need to carry his produce again and again. He can keep his produce in the warehouse. He will get a online receipt and that receipt, through that receipt, trading can happen again and again, no need to physically carry them. So all these things can be Since this question is in a positive sense, how does it technology help farmers in production and marketing of agriculture products? So to build the contrast, just you can write one to uh, one or two challenges which farmers are facing. Is still internet connectivity or uh, Net connectivity in rural areas is still a challenge. So, net connectivity and uh, financial literacy you can add to this as a challenge. Because questions are asked, how it has helped. So, one or two challenges, even if it has not been asked, in a very briefly you can write those two or two challenges. Okay. Now, let's move on to the next question. State the objectives and measures of land reforms in India. State the objectives and measures of land reforms in India. This part is simple. I would say simple because everyone everywhere has read what were the land reforms done, its objectives. Second part is very interesting. Discuss how land ceiling policy on land holding can be considered as an effective reform under economic practice. Let me just discuss briefly about the first part. State the objectives and measures of land reform. So, measures we just need to write three, four land reforms, abolition of Javindari, 
abolition of abolition of gender NNC reform and then lands. Here we can also write land consolidation plan. And so these are the measures, and finally, you can write objectives like abolition of gender, bringing tenants in direct contact with the government, tenancy reforms, making tenants, uh, giving tenants the ownership by reducing the rent, land saving, giving land to the landless laborers from those people who are having more land. So, you, you wrote the measures and you wrote the objectives. And before that, in the intro, you need to define land reforms. What are land reforms? So, land reforms are basically measures policy which redistributes land from those people having few acres of land to the landless or having poor people. That is land reform definition. And in the intro, you should also write that India is started since in the post independence period, our economy was agri based and agriculture was mostly dependent on. Agriculture was dependent on land, so government initiated the land reform. This is the right intro. And then you write that government implemented several reforms and you write the objective. And then the second part is the second part is discuss how land seeking policy on land holding. A very interesting question, I find it. Discuss how land seeking policy on land holding, land seeking policy on land holding can be considered as an effective. Reform under equal mind. They have chosen the words very carefully. Discuss how land saving policy on land holding can be considered as an effective can be considered as an effective reform. See, generally, what you may have read is that when we see this question is very categorical about how it is considered as a reform. Under economic criteria. If they would have asked that how can you consider as a reform under social criteria, it would have been very easy. Because now the land will be available to more number of people. So socially, it will create equality, it will lead to equality. So social reform, very simple. If we are putting land selling, so the land will move from rich, uh, more people are in more acres of land to all the people. That is good. So under social reform, it's very simple to listen. Under economic reform, this way. And this is asking how it can be considered as a reform, effective reform under economic criteria. Because when you are putting a cap ceiling on land holding, that means economic wise, production will become costlier. You will not be able to achieve economies of the scale. Your production will be, these products, whatever you put it, it will be less competitive. If you're not able to uh, compete in the world market, if the land, if there is a cap on land selling and land, uh, land holdings are less, your quality of inputs become costly, your surplus is less, so in the sale also you are not able to get a better price. So, economy wise, most of everywhere we have read that land selling basically is not a reform as because when you are putting land selling, land holdings will be less. Per person and effectively, uh, in economic terms, it will not lead to better resource utilization. Product will be costly. Right? So, uh, so that's why this question is asking okay, how it can be considered a reform, effective reform under economic trend. So, if we are putting land ceiling, a cap on land holdings, how it can be considered as a reform? Economic criteria. So the answer could be suppose we put a ceiling, right? Let's say if we have not put a ceiling, then what is the case? In a particular area, there will be one person having huge acres of land and there will be a lot of landless laborers. Listen carefully. If we have not, in, not done this land reform, land ceiling, there will be one person having huge acres of land and most of the people will be having very less or no land at all. Now we are putting a cap. So when you are putting a cap, land is being distributed to the 
if we have not done land saving, then you consider farmer as a businessman. There will be monopolies or oligopoly. In one area, you consider a district area. If there is few persons having huge acres of land and most of the people not having land, it will create monopoly or oligopoly, which will result in more price, which is that in higher prices for the farm food. Because few people will be having production through land and most of the people will not be having. So when few persons will be having most of the produce, so they will bargain and they will fetch much better price and most of the people will suffer from this. So if we are putting land saving and farmer consider farmer as a business and they are selling their surplus produce, so when we are putting land saving, it is preventing monopolies or oligopolies. And by preventing monopolies or oligopolies, we are allowing competition among the farmers. If there would have been only one farmer having 1,000 acres, now there will be 100 farmers having 10 acres. This will allow competition among the farmers. There will be several suppliers, sellers. Prices will come down and it will benefit all the people. It will lead to competition. When there will be competition, the product prices will also be less. And when there will be competition, they will compete and they will try to become cost effective in production. So in that way, and of course, if you are putting a land saving and land being distributed, then the farmers, the earlier the teenagers will be converted to actual owners, and the actual owners will be more motivated in producing more and making their land more fertile, and they will try to increase the yield. In that sense, it is a reform under economic value, allowing more. It is this land saving is leading to more competition. This uh, land saving is preventing monopoly or oligopolies. This land saving is helping in reducing the prices of the agri commodities. This land saving is motivating farmers to make their land more fertile, better aid. All these steps can be considered as an effective reform under economic factors. So, land saving has helped, can be considered as an uh, effective reform under economic factors. How will you conclude? The best way to conclude, I think, uh, this question is that. So you have written these positive things, then you write, but in the last few years due to fragmented land holdings or it is not increasing much. So government has brought in Model Agricultural Land Leasing Act, which it has all states to implement, through which consolidation of land holdings can be done and economies of scale and cost competitiveness can be achieved. Let's move on to the next question. Most of the unemployment in India is structural in nature. Examine the methodology. He talks about methodology. Adopted to compute unemployment in the country and suggest improvements. So let's uh, first discuss the first part. Most of the unemployment in India is structural in nature. So, how you should start? You should write that uh, first you should be, uh, define unemployment. Unemployment is defined as the number of unemployed, the number of people unemployed in the labor force. Then you write that unemployment is of different types. You write all the types of unemployment. Unemployment is of different types, structural, cyclical, fictional, disguised. And then you write but the majority of unemployment in India is structural in nature. Is structural in nature. And then you write that how is structural unemployment, how, what are the ways, what are the reasons through which is structural unemployment right? So you write the majority of the, you wrote all types of unemployment, and then you write that, but for the majority of the unemployment is structural in nature. Is structural unemployment arises due to following reasons. First, Change in technology. Second, change in government policy. Third, people not willing to migrate to 
to locations where jobs are available, people not willing to not willing to migrate. Therefore, mismatch mismatch between what employers are looking for, what is this employers are looking for, and what the skills the labor force poses. You write all these things, and then one line you also write the example of this change in technology. There are a lot of people in uh, the country, for example, artificial intelligence system. Earlier, the teaching method was mostly physical. Now it is moving online. A lot of teachers have not been able to adapt. It. That is changing technology. So they may be rendered unemployed. Changing government policy. Government said that uh, thermal power plants or polluting plants, which are of you know, certain years, they should be closed down. Now the labor, which is not able to learn new skills and go to other industries, they will be rendered unemployed. Not willing to migrate, we have. More unemployment in uh, UP, Bihar, Odisha, West Bengal, and we have much more employment opportunities in Gujarat, Maharashtra. But a lot of people don't want to migrate for social reasons because they think that whatever they will earn, it will be expensive to rental and other things. So they are not willing to migrate. And then mismatch between what is required, what is skills are bars are demanding, and what our labor has. For example, the best example is. There is a lot of demand of jobs in artificial intelligence data analytics. And you know that there are a lot of people unemployed. Why? Because there is a mismatch. Unemployed people don't have skills, they have only the labor. Employers are asking for those skills, data analytics, AI. So there are jobs available in the economy. And there are unemployed people also. Why? Because there is a mismatch between what employers are looking for and what the Labor can supply. You all explain this. And then you write that most of the people presently who are unemployed, they fall into these categories. Right now, we don't have cyclical unemployment. You write that we don't have cyclical unemployment, we are not in the race system. We don't have frictional unemployment, very much. Frictional unemployment means that we have to change moving from one job to another job, one period to another location. Very negligible. Mostly it is structural age. Right? There is no separate data that how much is structural, but majority of the data is structural, so you justify that as an example. Then second part is examining the methodology adopted to compute unemployment in the country and suggest initiatives. So here First, you need to tell that who calculates the Of course, we will talk about methodology. So, you write that uh, unemployment in India is measured by NSO, National Statistical Office, through periodic labor force survey. EFS surveys, where you write a few points. Uh, it is done quarterly basis for uh, urban labor and it is done annually for uh, rural labor. You write these things. Then, you write the methodology adopted. By PLFS is there are two ways. One is a current weekly status, current weekly status, and the other is usual status. Under current weekly status, a person is considered unemployed if he is not able to find job even for one. If you are not able, able to find a job for a current weekly status, if suppose PLFS is uh, doing a survey. So, in current weekly status, it does a survey for the last week. The survey is being done today, it asks the questions about the last one week. And this is for 365, last 365 weeks. So, here we consider a person as unemployed who has not been able to find a job for at least one hour in previous week. Usual status. How unemployment is measured here? If, listen carefully, usual status, if a labor is in job or looking for a job 
for majority part of them. If a labor is employed or is looking for a job for majority part of the year, then he will be part of the labor force. Then you will be part of labor force. And so let's say that uh, for seven months, I said that uh, if a labor is in job or looking for a job, searching for a job for majority part of the year, then he will be part of labor force. Now, once he is part of labor force, let's say for seven months, if you are the seven months, which is majority portion of the year, then so if seven months he is in job, that will be part of uh, he that means he is part of the force. Now, seven months if he is in job, of course, he is, he will be considered employed. And if in that seven months he is in job only for two months and looking for a job for the rest of the months, then he will be considered as unemployed. Because unemployment is a condition under labor force. If someone is not part of labor force, definitely is not unemployed. So if a person is in job or looking for a job for majority part of the year, he will be part of labor force. Now if he is a part of labor force, then we can think of whether he is employed or unemployed. So once he becomes a part of the labor force, then we will see in that part, if majority of the time he is searching for a job, then he is unemployed, otherwise he is <coughs> So these are the two methodologies and while KLFS uh, survey calculates this, NSO calculates this for KLFS survey data collected for KLFS. The major labor force every 15 years of this plus that we can also write. And uh, regarding methodology, we can suggest that, for example, in the first, Current weekly status. We are saying that if a person is, is not able to find job at least for one hour, then he will be considered unemployed. So if a person is in job, not able to find job for even one hour, so this can be improved further. And suppose this usual status, which we said to majority part of. So if a person in majority part of the year, if a person, let's say, seven months, is a part of the year, and rest four months, uh, so rest five months, if he is not part of the year. Now when we are doing this survey, so this survey is done for urban, it is done uh, in, uh, quarterly. Now when you are doing this survey, so either this survey should be more frequent Otherwise, suppose today I am not searching for a job and survey is done, so I will not be unemployed. But if tomorrow I start looking for a job, but then survey is done only in rural areas after one year or in urban areas after one quarter, quarterly is done. So even if I started, so today survey was done, I was not looking for a job, so I will not be part of it. But tomorrow if I start searching for a job, I will, also, I will not be treated as unemployed. So it should be done more frequently as such. It may be done more monthly basis because weekly you will not tell you the exact picture of fine. So these improvements can be done, and for that we require data collection more frequently. Basically, if you can do it on a monthly basis, then it will be better. And how do you conclude this? Because the question is of unemployment, then you can write that the reform that uh, you have written on this, and then you write that because of the various measures or steps taken in the last few years, like GST, National Infrastructure Pipeline. Then uh, logistics policy, Gati Sakti, all this will help in minimizing structural unemployment. Plus, certain skill research is also. Because the question of structural unemployment, we have more structural unemployment. So, in the conclusion, you should use such things which is in contrast. So, here we have written that both structural unemployment, then you write certain government initiatives which are going to help in resolving the structural unemployment. For example, now UP is doing a lot of infrastructure development at this period. So, migration, whatever was the unemployment because people are not willing to migrate, 
that will be true. So you write certain steps which are helping in reducing the structural environment that is quite important and you must answer the problem Fine. Now let's move on to the next question. Distinguish between care economy and monetized economy. How can care economy be brought into monetized economy through women involved? Care economy means activities which goes into uh, taking care or providing the emotional or physical needs of the old age, young age or kids. For example, women taking care of children. Women doing all kinds of activities in the kitchen and house. Women taking or men taking care of old age parents. All of this is example of care economy. Care economy is basically informal economy, unpaid economy. Monetized economy is more formal in nature and it is paid. So, care economy is basically the economic activity which goes into taking care of parents and or police or uh, kids. So, you define that and you must also write that care economy is uh, unpaid and informal. That you must write. Monetized, it's mostly formal and paid for it. How can care economy be brought into monetized economy? So women involved. Women involved. So basically, we justify so this uh, justify this question to example. Women empowerment. If women will be more educated, skilled, empowered, then rather than taking care of people, rather than then uh, rather taking care of people, they will try to work. They will try to do a job. And through that job ordinance, they will try to hire all these activities. For example, through women empowerment, through education, if a woman starts working, then he keep, then she keeps her child in a crutch and she pays for it. And when she pays for it, then that means it is getting monetized, it is getting added to the field. When she was taking care, when she was not doing job, taking care of a child at home, it was care economy. When she is doing jobs, women empowerment, and when she is hiring a kid and paying, paying for the kid, then it is a own health. When they have, when a woman doesn't prepare food at home, and they have a woman hires a maid. And then she pays for the maid services, either for food preparation or for taking care of the home. Then it is getting money. Whether it is she is paying in cash or through online doesn't matter. But she is not doing the household activity and she has hired a maid, then it is getting money. Because earlier she was doing that work and for which she was not getting paid. Now she is doing work in her office, there she is getting paid. And she has hired. So in both ways, it is adding to the GDP. She is doing job, there it is getting monetized, and then now she has hired some maid, so it is uh, the maid she is paying, so there it is getting monetized. In the same way, a lot of people, those who are working, couple who are working, they have hired people to take care of their old age parents, and they are making good payments for that. That is also getting monetized. So, by taking example of all the three stages, kids. Old age and even young age people. Young age means whatever uh, food we are consuming, whatever activities we want, for that we have kept the servant. So, all these stages, kids, young and old age, all these activities are getting in the list. So, in that way, we can explain this thing. And then, we have written this thing, then just to conclude, you can add that GDP angle that. Since we are moving from a care economy to a monetized economy, it is adding more to our GDP, it is adding more to government's tax resources, which government is using for the welfare of the people, but it is it may not be so it is increasing GDP, but it may not be increasing the happiness 
in your life. Because when your mom prepares food and you hire a maid, there is a difference in the quality or satisfaction. So just like that, you build a contrast. This will add to the GDP tax GDP ratio, but it may not result as in this case. Next question. Explain the changes in cropping pattern in India in the context of changes in consumption pattern, so cropping pattern, in the context of consumption pattern, and marketing trends. Explain the changes in cropping pattern in India in the context of changes in, so basically you need to talk about that. How cropping pattern is changing because of the change in consumption pattern and because of the change in marketing conditions, how our cropping pattern is changing. So first you define cropping pattern. You define cropping pattern and give one or two examples. Then you write that there are several cropping patterns followed in it. Cropping pattern outcrops are distributed in the Then you write how, what are the different types of cropping pattern? Because see, this is a 15 marker question, and so you need to add more content to it. So you define cropping pattern, give one or two examples, and then you write that different, there are different types of cropping pattern. You just name them monocropping, multiple cropping, multiple cropping. Crop rotation, then mix farm, next crop in multiple cropping. Then there are again several subdivisions. Multiple cropping, there is a mixed cropping, intercropping, mixed cropping, and uh, Sequential cropping, then relay cropping. We don't need to define them, but we just need to write the names because we cannot. So you wrote about the cropping pattern. Give one or examples that this kind of cropping pattern is followed in this area. And then you write that cropping pattern changes. Cropping patterns are changing because of the changing consumption pattern in India. Then you write. So you need to have separate headings for how consumption pattern is leading consumption pattern is leading to a change in cropping pattern and market. So how consumption pattern is changing? You write four five points because of urbanization. People are consuming more protein rich types. So we have started producing even farmers are moving towards poultry and other items. Protein poultry meat dairy products. Then you write that because of health, because of the health uh, consciousness process is increasing, people are shifting more towards millets. People are shifting more towards millet. So there is an increased enthusiasm among the farmers to grow about the millets. So people are from rice and to a certain extent they have started changing to millets. Then in the consumption pattern, people have uh, see because of this mar my uh, migration happening to cities. More Whenever we migrate to cities, consumption of more processed items is starts to increase. So earlier, fresh items were produced. Now we are producing those items which can be easily processed and supplied to the cities. So earlier we are growing all types of vegetables. Now one area is focusing on one type of vegetable so that it can be processed on larger scale and can be supplied to urban cities. So in this way, our consumption pattern changes. So consumption pattern 
drives the changing this cropping pattern. How marketing conditions is changing? Earlier marketing conditions we can bring in this in app. Earlier we were not, certain farmers were not producing fish and rice because they were not able to sell their produce in the APMC. Now through Enam they can take their produce to the warehouses or NPOs and from there they can sell it through Enam. So marketing practices are changing. Government has launched export incentives. So earlier if a certain product was not demanded and they were not producing that. Now there is a lot of demand of organic products abroad. So a lot of farmers are shifting towards and this organic products we can right here also. And since marketing conditions are changing, that means through e-commerce portals, we can get access to the wider markets and maybe suppose for example, let's say in the rural area, earlier they were growing normal fertilizer vegetables. Now through e-commerce coming, they can connect to bigger cities and in bigger cities, metro, there is more demand for organic products. So they have started selling to organic products. There is a lot of uh, government has launched, for example, one district one product scheme. Through the, so one district one product what is doing, which is helping in PSA agricultural clusters, which is resulting in better marketing conditions. So farmers are shifting to more of high value added products. Indian consumption pattern is changing from wheat and rice. We are going more towards high value products, fruits, vegetables, and things. So a lot of the smaller marginal farmers are shifting towards uh, growing these vegetables or integrated farming. So all certain things are being created by them. certain things may be common to this, but most of the cropping pattern is being through consumption of market channels. And in every case you must write the examples. How will you conclude? We may write that this cropping, uh, cropping pattern is never fixed or stagnant. It keeps on evolving, it keeps on changing based on the evolving conditions of the economy, based on the evolving changes in the economy. So, cropping pattern in India it has never been permanent. Earlier, we were doing certain types of cropping pattern. Now, with urbanization, with changing lifestyle, we are moving. Depending on what are the marketing channels, open city keep on changing. So, in the conclusion, you just can write that. Due to the evolving conditions, uh, topic pattern in future also it will keep on changing based on uh, consumption or marketing. Then, next question What are the direct and indirect subsidies provided to farm sector? Direct, indirect subsidy provided to farm sector in India. Discuss the issues raised by the WP regulation. So, first part, what are the direct and indirect farm subsidies? So, in introduction, you can start with that government company started giving farm subsidies in the post revolution period, just to clear the background. Then you define all the subsidies can be classified as either direct or indirect. Then you write a difference. In direct subsidies, the consumers or producers in Direct subsidies, we directly sell or purchase in the market and money is transferred to the beneficiaries account. In indirect subsidies, the beneficiaries are acquired the benefit by changing the prices. By changing the prices. For example, I will give you an example of a, let's say interest, uh, interest, subsidy, interest subsidy. What happens right now? We Farmers get an interest of this. So let's say the market interest rate is 10%. Let's say market interest rate is 10%. From the bank, the farmers get at 7% and government provides 3% to the bank. This is indirect. Government is not giving 3% to us. If we would have borrowed from the market at the market at 10%, and if government would have given 3% to the farmer, this is direct. But here presently what is happening that farmers borrow at 7%. So 
In this, we are getting loan at a reduced price, at a reduced interest. So this becomes indirect. So what are direct and indirect? So you define, and then best way to write this is because asking what are the direct and indirect subsidies. Subsidies are provided by government. Now in India, farm subsidies are also provided by government. Farm, farm subsidies are provided by both central government and state government. So the best way to write is you write here farm subsidies. Farm subsidies. Then you write uh, direct. Then you write central district center. And then you write center direct subsidy. See, take one second. First, most of the subsidy are indirect, so you just get to write indirect subsidy center. MSP. Why MSP is indirect? Because if farmers could sell their produce in, let's say, market by 18 rupees and MSP is good. If farmers are selling directly in the market and from the market they are getting, they are getting 18 rupees and government is transferring 2 rupees in the farmers digital savings account, this is direct. But in India we don't do that. Government procures at the interest price. So, if a person is supplied some product at a reduced price or product is being procured at a higher price, then it is in that. Direct would be farmers. Let me uh, suppose government says that farmers can sell their produce anywhere in the market. Whatever is the difference between MSP and market price, that government will give it to the farmers account. This becomes direct subsidy. So, this is indirect. Now, the state gives uh, electricity subsidy. Now, electricity, the bill is less. So again, it becomes indirect. It, is, it depends on the state. Different states are giving a different way. But uh, for example, let's say equipments. Now, what happens? Certain irrigation-related pipes or irrigation-related equipments, farmers purchase at the market rate, and then. They submit the bill and then some states are transferring money in their accounts. So it will become that. Indirect means of the for interest. Right. Uh, farm subsidies. Uh, see, fertilizer. Government has started DBT, and government says direct, but the fertilizer subsidy. But it is not exactly that because still farmers don't get the money in the account. Farmers purchase urea or DAP and at the lesser price, and government transfers money into the fertilizer account. Uh, in direct, here we can write. Uh, this PNS. PNS. In this hand, if you remember the amount, one or two, right, like PM Kisan, it is given around 70,000 crore, you know, 6,000 per farmer per year. MSP subsidy, food and MSP combined is 1.97 lakh crore, you can make it half. Fertilizer subsidy, 1 lakh 75,000. Whatever data you remember, you can write it. Then, second part discuss the issues raised by the WTO in relation to agricultural subsidies. In relation to agricultural subsidies. So, you should be aware that what exactly the WTO has raised this. WTO has said that, first we need to uh, explain this thing, that what exactly WTO is saying. So, question that is not excluded by the WTO in relation to agricultural subsidy. So, you write that uh, most, a lot of governments are giving agricultural subsidies 
and WP is not against all the subsidies. There are certain subsidies, government support, which distort agriculture. WP is against only those kind of agricultural subsidies. The various subsidies which to which WP is objecting is you write is MSP for dialysis. Electricity subsidy. You write. And then you write, WQ has raised the following concerns regarding these subsidies. First, these subsidies are distorting agricultural works. These subsidies are distorting cropping patterns. These subsidies are distorting international trade. These subsidies are making products costlier for consumers. For example, in India, if we are producing wheat at rupees 18 per kg, if farmers are selling wheat at rupees 18 per kg, there is no MSP. So we may export at 18 rupees per kg. And other countries' consumers may get this food. But rather than that, government of India announced MSP 22 rupees per kg. So rather than Indian farmers selling at 18 rupees per kg abroad and uh, other countries' consumers would have benefited, government of India procured at MSP. So, because of this uh, MSP subsidy, other countries' consumers are at risk. International trade got distorted. If there would not have been MSP, we would have exported, but government would do. So, this is resulting in distortion of agricultural trade, distortion of agricultural market, market, distortion of cropping pattern. It distorts competition, international competition. It has led to environmental degradation. So you write the issues. And then you write about the present situation. You, since you have mentioned WQ, so you also write about the context and so you write that in the WQ's uh, ministerial conference, the WQ's ministerial conference held at Bali, it was agreed that these subsidies will be minimized and peace clause will end by 2017, but peace clause has been made intact and developed countries and developing countries are not reaching at a consensus in resolving, in reducing these distorting species. This we can write. And then, one point may you also add that the uh, WTO's concerns are genuine, but we also need protect our farmers, but it is always that, but it will be better that we move towards income gifts. Or you can also write that, you wrote all these things, then you just write that because the concerns raised by W2, because of the environmental concerns, government of India has started moving from price subsidies, indirect subsidies to direct subsidies through the Marmar and Jam Trinity. And then it has started moving towards income support based things, which is allowed under green box development in this country. Fine. So that's all about means discussion. And one suggestion that whenever you are writing answers, of course, one or two points you can add extra or but just read the question carefully. What exactly they are asking? Whatever they are asking, that must be elaborated. And whatever is not being asked, that, that you can just uh, write in one or two ways. And whatever question you ask, if you are writing that question, then try to conclude by giving some contrast. Use data and whatever I suggested for the answer I can Okay. So overall, why do you ever? These questions were on that same previous lines, whatever I asked since last few years. Similar type of questions, similar topics. Most of the students have studied this. So, quite doable, and I would say on an easier side, this is question. But let's see the marks, how you fetch that mark because everyone who writes means they say that I have written. You have written, but what they have asked exactly, you have written in that way. That so, go for the rest. Thank you. Unacademy.
Let's crack it.